And Paul says, I thank you. This is really interesting to me, and I'll tell you why. We always thank God for all of you mentioning you in our prayers. Well, I got to thinking, do I thank God for people when I pray? When I pray with my girls when we go to bed, do I thank God for people? Or do I, you know, and I, and I realize that the way I pray is I'm kind of telling God to do things for people. And so I'm really, I'm convicted by this. I'm going to try to pray and model with my girls. I want to ask you to do the same, to thank God for people. I have a tendency, if I can uh, remember and, and go through, I'm not perfect at this, but I go through Blackhawk and I go through people that I'm involved with and people in the buildings and people on staff and I pray for them and their families. But again, it's a be with, do this kind of a thing. And I'm going to start thanking God for them. And I think some changes in my heart might occur, and I encourage you to do the same thing. Prayer, pro suke, pro means from, suke from the soul. Prayer is my heart, my soul connecting with the very heart and the very soul of God. And, I, you know, it's tough for me to do this, but I'm going to challenge you to do it. Would you consider men praying audibly with your wife every night? I've only done it for seasons at a time, and I'm ashamed to say it. I don't have a problem if I'm at an auction and it's broadcast live on ESPN2 to 50, 60 million people. No big deal to me. I kind of like that. Pray audibly with my wife. Ooh, scary. I don't know why, but I'm going to try to do that. Thanking God for all his blessings. I have no problem praying audibly with my kids. You know what? I didn't want to do it, but I even prayed with my employees. I was afraid they wouldn't do it. Amazing what happened, just amazing. It was that first step that was the hardest. I was afraid to do it. Fear kept me from it. I actually prayed with customers about auctions uh, that, that we were having for them about um, maybe it was an estate or maybe it was a guy's life savings or something. And I got to tell you, it's amazing what happened. The only reason I don't do it is fear. So I encourage you, would you do that? Would you torch up prayer in your life, your soul connecting with God's soul? And here's the three hallmarks, and here's the three conducts, and it's uh, faith, work produced by faith, labor prompted by love, endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll only find them in Christ. In fact, let's read Romans 5, 1 through 5. I think it's coming on the screens. This kind of sums the whole deal up connects it all together. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace through God, our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. See, we're there. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Glory is a revelation of God's character and presence. And we rejoice in Christ because that's where we see it. Remember? It's one of my favorite verses. In the face of Jesus Christ is the glory of God. Verse 3, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. That's interesting. I'm going to be joyful in my sufferings, in my endurance, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Not wishful thinking, but confident assurance. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Faith, hope, love. Work, labor, endurance. If you want to take work, labor, endurance and sum it up in one word, serve. Serve. Their response and ours to the initiative of the grace and peace of Christ. This is, by the way, verse 3 is the vision of our church is faith, our, our response is faith, love, and hope. Faith, let's look at that first. Acronym, if you want it. Forsaking all, I trust him. If you want to write it down, faith can be an acronym. Forsaking all, I trust him. Illustration, you walked in today, I've shared this with kids a lot. You walked in today, I watched you, you walked down the aisle, you went down to your pew, and boom, sat in your pew. Nobody did this. You know, nobody did that. That's faith. Everybody has faith. The question is the object of our faith, all right? You have faith, trust, that the, that the floor will hold your weight and that the pew will hold your weight. The, uh, great theologian says it this way, that it's, it's, uh, it's my belief in my mind. That's, that's what most people think, believe in faith. They're the same word in Greek. That's what most people in our culture treat it as. Well, yeah, I believe that Jesus died on a cross, resurrected from the dead. Yeah, I got that life insurance. See ya. No, 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 no. That's just a mental ascent. So it's not just my mind, it's my emotional conviction. Like, I believe that pew is there. 
End of story. That's mental assent. But there's an emotional conviction. You know, I really believe, I would go tell people that there's a pew right there. But the, the third part is trust. Until I sit in the pew, until I, as Paul just said in Romans 5, stand in the grace of God, until I am in Christ, until I trust Christ with all of my life, full surrender, 24-7, I have not experienced the faith that he's talked about. And we know that God is the source of this faith. Jesus Christ, Hebrews 12, 1, 2, and 3, it talks about that he is the author and perfecter of our faith. Hebrews 11, 1 gives a great definition for it. Uh, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It goes on in verse 6 to say, without faith, what we just talked about, it is impossible to please God. God is faithful. He gets Moses on the mountain, Exodus 34, 6, and he describes himself. And one of the words he uses, he says, I'm faithful. God is faithful. He's the source. And because of that, because you're in Christ, then your faith and your trust will result in work. The writers of Scripture know nothing about a life of saying, I believe that, but I'm going to maintain control of my own life. That is so far from the truth in Scripture, it's pathetic. And anyone who preaches it should not preach it. Because what I do in Christ, who I am in Christ, results in behavior. Faith without works is dead, James writes. It's about a full surrender of all of my life. Work, in the Greek ergon, is where we get ergonomics. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, that this is all a gift, salvation by grace through faith in Christ. In order to do the work he's prepared you to do, the good deeds of love, you are God's workmanship, poem A. We are God's poem. He's writing on our hearts every single day. And God works, Jesus said, my father's at work. And so should I. Here's how Paul did it. Paul had a two-fold business plan on how, I call it a business plan, on how he was going to communicate the gospel of Christ, who's a person of God, to everybody. First, he'd go to the synagogues. He'd go to the synagogues, and they were open 24-7, by the way. That's really interesting. And he would preach there that Christ is the Messiah. We see that in Acts 17. And many would believe. But then when things got a little rough, he was in Thessalonica for three Sabbaths where he preached. Uh, he'd have to go out, and he'd plant a church. What is it that he planted? Was it a building? Was it pew? Was it a pew? No. It was Christ. In Christ. In Christ. And so you and I got to ask, does my faith, does my full surrender to him really result? Do, am I really in communion with him? Does my life really show it? Or is it just something I want to believe? But does my life really show it? Do I really read the Bible in communion with God? Do I, uh, do I pray? Ruth Graham says, if you pray for less than five minutes, the only voice you'll hear is your own. Now, is that really, am I characterized and known by those things? And finally, he talks about love. The hallmark of full surrender is love, and its conduct is labor. And here we see the community in Christ. Paul says in Galatians 5, 6, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And here's where we see the second part of Paul's plan on how he's going to carry the gospel. He would go into urban centers or marketplaces where there were a lot of traffic. So the Ignatian Way, the north-south arteries, the harbor, and he would preach in the marketplace. And we found archaeological discoveries of that marketplace where he preached. This is true. And he says in 1 Thessalonians that I was there and we were doing it day and night in the marketplace. He says that he was making tents there. You, your marketplace, my marketplace, outside this building. That's where it all happens. That's where it all happens. 24-7 in Christ, labor of love because God is love. He is the source. You know, I, was, uh, I took about 10 days to spend with Susan after we had the baby. And uh, uh, talking to uh, someone who's going to bring a meal over. I don't know if I told you this or not. But I was uh, complimented for staying with her for that time period. And I did that pretty much with all of our girls. And uh, I made this comment. I said, well, I've been feeling a little guilty about it. And here's why. 
I felt I had these thoughts, and maybe part of it is because I'm a guy. But I thought, well, I should be doing something for the church. I should be doing something for Blackhawk. You know, I had these stack of books I was going to read. There were some things we were working on. I said, I should be doing this. I should be doing that. And I was staying in touch, but there were some things I kept thinking I should be doing. Well, the bottom line is, the church in Christ with my wife. That's what God's called me to do. That's what God's called you to do. We got to quit making it about a building or a program.